Let's look in a little bit more detail at what makes a good measurement. We've already said that all measurements, regardless of whether they're taken in a technical setting or whether it's from your day-to-day -day life, all measurements will have two parts. For instance, if you were to take the mass of a small object and determine it weighs 15 grams, there's two pieces of information there. The part that we have been talking about in previous lectures is the part labeled as the unit, or the grams in this case. And that tells us what unit we use to take the measurement. The other part of the measurement, and what we'll focus on in this lecture, is the number. Now, even though numbers are something you're obviously comfortable looking at, in science we have to pay them a lot of attention. And the first thing to realize is that when we have a number, if it's truly going to be part of a good, member, a good measurement, we need to make sure that it has two qualities. The first is that that number is accurate. In order for a number and a measurement to be accurate, it has to be as close to the actual value as possible. So if I weighed an object and it had a mass of 15 grams, and I tell you it weighed 15 grams, I'm being accurate. Whereas if the object actually had a mass of 500 grams, and I tell you it weighs 15 grams, that would be very inaccurate. But in addition to being accurate, the other quality that we look for is we like numbers that are precise or have precision. What precision is, is it's basically how certain we can be about a measurement. And a lot of people think about precision in terms of how many decimal places the measurement has. Think about the example of 15 grams. It's not necessarily clear from the way that's written how sure I am about that measurement. For example, does that object weigh about 15 grams? Does it actually weigh 14.6 grams or 15.2 grams? We're not necessarily sure because there's no decimal places here to give us extra information. If that was a very precise measurement, I might say that the object weighed 15.001 grams. That's very precise because there's a lot of decimal places. Whereas if I'm being imprecise, I might say that that object weighed about 15 grams. We'll see in this section that being both accurate and precise is really important in science. And there's a number of ways we can write down numbers to ensure that we communicate that information effectively. One of the first truths about dealing with numbers in a scientific setting is that sometimes our numbers will be simple to read and write, like the number 15, but many times in science we find ourselves dealing with very, very large and very, very small measurements. In other words, values that might have a lot of digits. Sometimes those digits are many, many zeros. Sometimes there's a lot of digits that are other than zero. In science, because this can make it inconvenient to write those values down, we often employ something called scientific notation. And if you look at the word scientific notation, all it really means is notation, or how we write something, in science. And in fact, scientific notation is something that you can use, and that all scientists use, whenever a number looks, or feels, or is too long. So what does that mean? Well, if you look at a number and it just seems like there are way too many digits for you to deal with, even if it just feels like it's overwhelming, that's a good time to use scientific notation. Because in fact, there's no strict rule about when you will and won't use scientific notation. It's just something we use when we find it to be convenient. The only time you absolutely have to use scientific notation well, actually, there's two cases. We'll see in some cases, scientific notation helps us to indicate exactly how precise we want a measurement to be, because it uses decimal places. But the other time when you'll find yourself having to use scientific notation is on your calculator. You'll notice that the screen of your calculator only has so much space in it, so if you're dealing with a number that has way too many digits to fit on the screen, your calculator will use scientific notation to give you that information. The format for all values that are written in scientific notation is always the same, and it looks like this. A times 10 to the B. In other words, there's a number out front, which I'm representing here as the blue A, and it's multiplied times 10 raised to an exponent, which I'm representing with the orange B. The only things that ever change when you write scientific notation are the value of A and the value of B. The middle part, the times 10, is always there. 
And the reason scientific notation works is it simply acknowledges the fact that every time you multiply a number times 10, you're essentially moving the decimal point in one direction. The same thing is true if you divide by 10 or multiply by 10 to a negative exponent. So let's look at an example of how you write a number in scientific notation. I'm going to start with an example of a relatively big number. Now this number has a pretty large value. It's the value 32, me sorry, pardon me, 32 million meters. And that means it has quite a few digits that we have to deal with. If you're comfortable writing 32 million, you can do that. And most calculators could probably fit this on the screen, although some would start to not have enough space for it. To change this into scientific notation, we're always going to follow the same steps. First, we're going to move the decimal point from where it is to where it has to be, which is behind the first non-zero digit. And what I mean by that is if you look on the left side of this number, on the left side of the number, the very first non-zero digit is the number 3. So what I want to do is move the decimal so it's just behind that number 3. To do that, I start with where the decimal point is, or where it's implied to be, which is at the end of the value, and I'm going to move it all this way until it gets to this position. Then I write down that value. So I'm going to write down 3.2, and in this case I'll just leave off the zeros. Now, using common sense, you know that the number 32 million is really different from the number 3.2. So that's where the second part of scientific notation comes in. I'm going to write down times 10, and then I'm going to raise it to the power of however many t places I had to move the decimal point. So my decimal point started here, and I had to move it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 places to get it behind that first non-zero digit. Because of that, I'm going to use the exponent 7. So 3.2 times 10 to the 7 is the same as writing 32 million, and then I'll put my label afterwards, in this case meters. In all examples of scientific notation, we always make sure that there is exactly one digit that is not a zero before the decimal point, and then you can have as many as you need after the decimal point to convey the correct degree of precision. When dealing with very small numbers, numbers less than 1, we have to go in the opposite direction. Let's look an example, at an example of that, and then we'll do some practice problems. Now I've taken the number 32, but I'm using it in a context where it implies a very, very small value. This is the number 0 0.0000032 meters. You can see that because it has a lot of digits, it starts to be a lot of information to convey. And really, on a very practical level, it's not uncommon for someone to write one too many zeros or accidentally leave one out, which we don't like in science when there's a high chance that someone's going to make a mistake. So let's change this very small number into scientific notation. I'm going to follow the same steps. First, I want to find my non-zero digit that is furthest to the left. So starting on the left side of the numbers, these are all zeros, so I'm going to skip over them. And my first non-zero digit, as far out left as I can go, is the number 3. So I want to move my decimal point till it's after the 3, but before the 2. So in this case, I get the exact same effect that I had before, which is that I'm going to write down the value 3.2. Now I'm going to apply the same thinking. 3.2 is a very different value from 0 0.00000032 meters. Obviously one of those is large and one is small. So I have to use times 10, and I'm going to raise it to the power of however many places I had to move the decimal. When you have to move the decimal to the right, you're dealing with smaller numbers. In other words, you really are dealing with a negative exponent, or the effect of dividing by 10. So I'm going to look at how many places I had to move the decimal point, but it's going to be in a negative exponent form. So here's my decimal as it exists now, and I'm going to move it to see how many places it had to go to get to 3.2. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So notice in this case, I had to move it seven places, but seven places to the right. When you move the decimal right, you'll get a negative exponent. 
so my scientific notation would be 3.2 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. Let's do some examples so that you can practice. For each of the following values, go ahead and put the number into scientific notation. I'm going to put up all three practice questions first. You can pause the video and take your time to do them one by one, or you can do all three and then play through the video. Here's the three examples. The first number is 546 million. The second number is 0 0.0325. And the third number is 45.607. Go ahead and put each one of these into correct scientific notation. Let's look at the correct way to put these numbers into scientific notation. I always start by moving the decimal place to the first, sorry, to behind the first non-zero digit on the left side. So from the left side of each one of these, we'll do these one at a time. In the first example, my first non-zero digit is a 5, so I know the decimal will go right behind it. That means my answer for now is going to be 5.46. I'm just knocking off the zeros. As for the, why we knock off the zeros, or when we round and when we don't, that has to do with the correct precision for the number, which we'll get into a little more later on. For now, we'll just leave off the zeros. Now I need to write it in scientific notation. So 5.46 times 10, and I have to figure out what exponent to put. Well, there's an implied decimal point here, which means I've moved it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 places. So I would write 5.46 times 10 to the 8 and then label it with whatever unit I was given. Now let's do the next one. Again, I look at the left side of the, of the number and I find my first non-zero digit, which in this case is a 3. So I know my decimal is going to go right after that 3, which will give me the value 3.25. Now I need to figure out what exponent to raise it to, and I remember that because this is a very small number, less than 1, or the fact that I move the decimal to the right means I'm going to have to have a negative exponent. So here's the existing decimal, and I moved it 1, 2 places, so to the negative 2. Again, the negative is because I moved the decimal right and not left. Let's look at the third example. The number 45.607 is not a particularly hard value to write, so you might choose to not use scientific notation at all in this value, but you could. Again, scientific notation is something it's always your choice or your option to use. So for practice, let's put this into scientific notation. I start from the left-hand side and I find my first non-zero digit. In this case, that's the 4, and so I'm going to move my decimal point to directly after the 4. That means I really only have to move this one place, and that's fine. So to rewrite this, since I don't have any zeros to drop at the end, I'll just rewrite the whole value, 4.5607. Again, there weren't really any zeros off on the right-hand side, so I'm not going to drop any of them, because I want to be as precise as my data allows me to be. Now to figure out what exponent to write, I'm going to write times 10, and I had to move the decimal one place, so times 10 to the 1. As you can tell, a lot of times if you only have a value of times 10 to the 1 or 10 to the 2, many times we don't put those values into scientific notation. But when they're large values, like 10 to the 8, you can see that sometimes that's a simpler way to write it. So we've looked at the idea that all good measurements in science have both a number and a unit, and a good measurement will have a number that's been me measured both accurately and as precisely as possible. However, here's one of the issues in modern science. We very rarely work with just one measurement. In other words, let's think about the example of when a pharmaceutical company develops a life-saving drug. In order for that drug to come to market, it had to be researched for years, which means that drug had to go through millions and literally billions of measurements. Those measurements were done by different scientists in different laboratories, maybe even in different cities or different countries, and all that data or all those numbers had to be combined together. When you do that, you end up with a very practical issue, which is that 
for all those different labs, if one lab measures more accurately or more precisely than another lab, the lab that's lacking in precision and accuracy impacts all future measurements. So let's look at this on a much smaller scale so we can see how it affects us in our day-to-day -day scientific settings. Imagine that you work somewhere where you and your coworker have been asked to prepare two samples and then add them together. This is you. You are smart and you are hardworking and you are careful and you measure things accurately and as precisely as possible. I know you do. So you're asked to measure the mass of something that you'll add together with your coworker and you say, I have very carefully determined the mass of this sample to be 12.0002 grams. Just looking at that number, you can tell how precise it is. It has a lot of decimal places. It's obvious that you carefully measured this value and furthermore, you probably didn't weigh this object or this sample on a bathroom scale at home because your bathroom scale doesn't have that many decimal places. You probably measured it on a very good scientific device in a laboratory. So you determined that the mass of a sample is 12.0002 grams and then your coworker with a similar sample is asked to do the same thing. And here's your coworker. You have all had this coworker at some point in your life. Your coworker is asked to do the exact same thing, and what does your coworker do? Hmm, your coworker eyeballs it, or your coworker kind of slips and pours out some of the sample by accident, or your coworker doesn't even wait for the scale to stop shaking and the numbers stop changing before writing down a value. So your coworker is given almost an identical sample, and your coworker says, eh, I don't know, I guess the sample's about 12 grams. Looking at that value and comparing it to your very carefully measured value, you can see there's a very different degree of precision in these two measurements. And that's a problem because if you've been asked to add these two things together, you're only as sure as your weakest link. Because if you give this to a calculator, here's what your calculator is going to say. If you add together 12.0002 grams and add to it 12 grams, your calculator will tell you that the final answer is 24.0002 grams. You can try it on your calculator, I'll wait. But the issue here is if you look at the number 24.0002, that sure looks like a very precise number. And in fact, what it's doing is it's hiding the fact that your coworker really just had an approximate measurement. For instance, think about the 12 grams that your coworker sort of measured. Maybe that sample didn't weigh 12 grams. Maybe it weighed 11.9. Maybe it weighed 11.5. That would drastically change my final answer when I add these two things together. So the issue when, it de when we deal with multiple measurements being added, subtracted, multiplied, or divided with each other is that sometimes we need to round our final answer so that we communicate exactly how sure we truly are. In other words, you're only as strong as your weakest link. No matter how carefully you measure your sample, if you have a weaker link or a coworker that doesn't do such a good job, it trivializes that for every other measurement. Let's look at how we, how we have rules that help us avoid this or at least communicate it when we do calculations in science. The basic way that scientists ensure that we never make something look more precise than it is, in other words, that we never hide the fact that we have a coworker who rounded things, is that we have a very strict set of rules for how much we round our numbers. And this is actually going to be a nice thing for you because when you do a calculation on your calculator and you get a value that has many, many decimal points, something like 24.0143216, your instant response is going to be that you want to round it. And the answer is you can round it, but you have to know how much. So let's look first at addition and subtraction. Let's take the example that we just used, where you weigh something and it has a mass of 12.0002 grams, 
and someone else weighs something and it has a mass of 12 grams. Your calculator says the answer should be 24.0002, but that's because your calculator is dumb. So instead, we have to remember we're only as strong as our weakest link. The technical way that we say that in science is that when you add or subtract numbers, you must round your final answer to match the number of decimal places in your least precise operand. Okay, that sounds kind of technical, but let's look at what that really means. Least precise operand means number you started with that has the fewest decimal places. If we look at this example, the number you measured has one, two, three, four decimal places. The number that your coworker measured has zero decimal places. So, in addition and subtraction, you must round your final answer to match the number of decimal places in your least precise operand. This value has zero decimal places. Your value had four. Zero is definitely the smaller value or the least precise value. So I have to round my final answer so that it has zero decimal places. My calculator said 24.0002 grams, and I need to round this so it has no decimal places. It means these are all going to go away. So what I would actually write down after we're all done adding things together is I would say 24 grams. If you think about this, that almost makes common sense. If my coworker says, meh, it weighs about 12 grams, that's your weakest link, so your final reported answer for this calculation would be, meh, about 24 grams. That's only as precise or as sure as we can be about the value. Let's look at another example where we take a number that's slightly more precise and see how that affects things. So let's say you have that coworker who said, meh, about 12 grams. You fire that coworker because nobody wants to work with someone that like that. And you hire another coworker who is still not quite as gifted, skilled, careful, and precise as you are, but improves on things. So now when you give the same task to that coworker, your value stays the same because you're just as a hard worker as you've always been, but your new coworker weighs the sample and determines that it weighs 12.00 grams. Now, if your coworker determines the sample weighs 12.00 grams, that's not quite as precise as yours, but it is an improvement. So, to figure out how to round my answer, notice your calculator doesn't know there's any difference between your first coworker and your second one. Again, your calculator is dumb. So we're going to look at the number of uh, the number of decimal point places. You had four decimal places, and that hasn't changed. Your new new coworker provided a value that has two decimal places. So I have to round my final answer so it matches my least precise operand. In this case, that means two decimal places. So go ahead and round the number 24.0002 so it has two decimal places. To do that, all I'm going to do is cut off these last two values. That leaves me with 24.00 grams. Another thing about rounding here, you're going to use the same rules you've always used with rounding. Meaning, if I have to cut off a value and the value is 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9, I will round up the digit immediately to the left, but only if it's the last value I'm cutting off. You don't need to look too far to find out if you're going to round. So in addition and subtraction, we basically are just looking at the number of decimal places so that we can decide how to round correctly. In multiplication and division, there's a little bit more to consider, and the reason is this. Imagine taking two relatively small numbers and multiplying them together. Very quickly, that will give us a result that's a much larger number. So it's often not feasible to just look at decimal places. Instead, when it comes to multiplication and division, we often round on the basis of digits entirely, not just decimal digits. In multiplication and division, we'll always round our final answer so it has as many significant figures as our least precise operand. 
Significant figures is a technical term that's used in science classes, but for the most part it just means digits. So we always round our final answer so it has as many digits as our least precise operand or our operand with the fewest digits. There's a couple caveats to that that we'll look at in a few minutes, but let's start with some simple examples. Let's say we have two numbers to multiply together, and the numbers are 2.03 and the number 2. When we multiply 2.03 times 2, our calculator tells us the answer is 4.06, but we need to round so that we have the correct degree of precision, and we do that by rounding our final answer so it only has as many digits as the least precise operand. If we look at our operands, or our starting values, the number 2.03 has three digits in the number. If we look at the second operand, the number two, there's only one digit. So to round our final answer, we need to round it so it has a, as many digits as the least precise operand. Because this first value has three and the second one has one, our least precise operand just has one digit. So I need to round my final answer from what the calculator gave, which is 4.06. I'm just going to cut off these last two values to get the number 4. And it sort of makes sense, in a common sense way, that if you have the number 2.03 times the number 2, that's really only as good as saying you have 2 times 2, or 4. Let's do another example. If you multiply the numbers 1.2 times 34, your calculator will tell you the answer is 40.8. Take a second and see if you can decide if we need to round that value and by how much. Feel free to pause the video. So to decide how to round this final answer, if at all, we need to look at our initial numbers. The number 1.2 has 1, 2 digits in it. The number 34 has 1, 2, 2 digits. So in this case, both of our starting values have two digits, so our final answer needs to have two digits as well. As I go to round the answer 40.8, initially it has three digits, so I'll cut off this last value. However, notice that the last digit is the number 8. Remember that any time this value is greater than 5, so the digit 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9, we always round up. In this case, this gives us a final rounded answer, 41. Whenever we're working with multiplication and division, we always look at the number of digits. The only reason this gets any more complicated is the fact that there are some zeros which actually don't count as significant figures. In other words, there are some zeros out there that won't count as digits. It's not that they're not important. What they really are is placeholders. They're essentially there just to give some magnitude or sense of size to the value. Let's look at those in more detail. So the zeros that don't count as significant figures, or the zeros that you'll basically ignore when counting digits, really fall into two different categories. The first category are numbers that have a decimal point. Anytime you're looking at a number with a decimal point, it's possible that you will have some zeros that you shouldn't count as digits. And those decimal, or in those decimal point numbers, the zeros that you'll get to ignore are what we call leading zeros. These are zeros on the left hand side of the number. For everything else will count just the same way we've been counting figures in these previous two examples. Let's look at the example of the value 0 0.005. Notice that this, first of all, is a value that has a decimal point. Because it has a decimal point, that means any zeros that are to the left of the non-zero digits, not necessarily to the left of the decimal, but just on the left-hand side of the non-zero digit, are not going to count as decimal points. So when the number is 0 0.005, as I read from left to right, my first non-zero digit is a 5. So that's definitely going to count as one digit for the purpose of rounding. Because this is a decimal number, anything to the left of this first non-zero digit will not count. In other words, I'm not going to count these as digits. 
I still have to write them, and they still give important information as to the value of this number, but when it comes to rounding, this is essentially a value that has only one digit when it comes to rounding. So let's look at how this would affect us if we ended up doing a calculation. Let's say you took the number 0 0.005 and you multiplied it by a number like 22. Well, your calculator, when you do 0 .005 times 22, will give you the answer 0.11. We have to follow the rule that we previously learned, that in multiplication and division, we round our final answer so it has as many significant figures, or as many digits, as our least precise operand. As we said, in 0 0.005, there is only one significant figure, or one digit that we actually count. We don't count the zeros to the left. In the number 22, there's two digits. Again, very simple because we don't have any zeros to have to consider. So when I write my final answer, I have to look at my least precise operand. The number 2 versus the number 1, well that means I'm limited to just one digit in my final answer. So to correctly round 0 0.11, I have to round it till it has just one digit. Notice I still have a zero to the left of the decimal point. That's okay because this zero doesn't count towards increasing the precision of the measurement. In other words, it's not a significant figure, whereas the one is. Here's why that matters. This allows us to write the zero before the decimal point making it obvious that there's a decimal point. That's really the only reason we need to do that. And it has the correct degree of precision, because whereas the first value, 0 0.005, had one significant figure, the second value, 22, had two significant figures, my final answer has just one significant figure. Let's look at a couple more examples to help this make sense. If we have a new measurement, very similar to this previous one, of 0. 0050, how many significant figures, or in other words, how many digits are we actually going to count for this value? Remember that in any number with a decimal, regardless of where the decimal is, the leading or left-hand zeros do not count. In other words, the zeros to the left of the non-zero digits. So in the number 0 0.0050, I'm going to start on the left, and notice that I have a bunch of these insignificant figures, or in other words, digits we won't count. My first non-zero digit is this 5. The ones that won't count, or the digits that we don't count, are all the zeros to the left of it. So those zeros will not count as digits, and they don't increase the precision of our measurement. What about this zero after the 5? Well, the rule that the leading or left-hand zeros do not count applies only to the left-hand zeros. This zero is to the right of the non-zero digit, so it does count. And notice what we've done in the difference between our first measurement and our second measurement. Their values are the same, 0 0.005, but this second measurement has an additional zero, which makes it a more precise measurement. We don't want to lose that precision when we calculate our final answer. So if I took this value and multiplied it by 22, again, which has two digits, my calculator sees these as being the same value. The answer would be 0 0.11. When I think about rounding this, I need to round it so it matches the number of digits in my least precise operand. In other words, what did I start with? So here's two digits, here's two digits, so I actually would leave this exactly as it is, 0 0.11, to give my final answer. Notice again, this has two digits that are significant and one that isn't. And also notice that in this second example, because we had a more precise starting operand of 0 0.0050, that additional zero allowed us to be more sure or more precise in our final answer. Let's try one more example with this, and then we'll go on and do some more practice. Imagine that now I have even a more precise value, and what I'm going to do is multiply this by 22.0. Take a second and see if you can figure out how to write the final answer for this, for this question 
the, the calculator will give you the answer of 0 0.11. Go ahead and take a second, see if you can figure out how we would round or not round this final answer. It's okay to pause the video if you want. Okay. So our calculator gives us the answer of 0 0.11, and I need to decide, is that the correct final answer, or do I need to round or otherwise adjust it? Well, let's look at the number of significant figures, or digits we're going to count, in my starting operands. My first value is 0 0.00500. This has a decimal point, so I'm going to remember that any digits to the left of the non-zero digit, the first non-zero digit, won't count. My first non-zero digit, as I go from left to right, is a 5. This 5 and everything after it is going to count, whereas the zeros before it do not. So again, the zeros on the left don't count, the zeros on the right do. That means that I have a total of 3 digits. When I take this number and multiply it times 22.0, my calculator tells me the answer is 0 0.11. But 0 0.11 has just two digits. This is the opposite case of what we've been looking for. This is the case where the calculator is actually giving you information that's less precise than what you're sure about. We know that we have a precision or a certainty of three digits in my first operand, and look at my second operand. Here the two and the two are significant figures. This zero is on the right hand side, so it's also significant. Remember, in cases where there's a decimal point, it's only the digits on the left that are ever cut out. So here I also have three digits. That means my final answer has to have three digits, and the way the calculator shows it, it only has two. So how do I solve this problem? Well, I need to indicate that it's more precise. There isn't another digit here after those ones, so what I'm going to put there is a zero. My final answer would be 0 0.110. Again, the zero on the left side doesn't count, everything else does, and this value, 0 0.110, is more precise than 0 0.11. Basically, that final zero just tells us we're even more sure about that measurement. That 0.11 was not an estimate, we're very certain about the value. So anytime we have a decimal value, the leading or the left-hand zeros do not count. But what about numbers without a decimal? Well, what we'll see is with decimal numbers, we tend to look and ignore at the zeros that are on the left side numbers that don't have a decimal, we're actually going to look towards the right side. Let's look at some examples now. In numbers without a decimal, we're going to always have to deal with the fact that there might be zeros to the right of the non-zero digits. And this tends to happen in very large numbers. So previously we looked at the number 32 million meters. The issue with this number scientifically is that the zeros that are to the right of the non-zero digits, meaning if my non-zero digits are the 3 and the 2, all these other zeros, they may be there just as a result of rounding. So for instance, if I tell you that the length of a road trip was 32 million meters, most likely it wasn't exactly 32 million meters, most likely I rounded. Maybe it was 31,979,245 meters, so I rounded it to 32 million. We don't count these rounding or right-hand zeros as significant figures. So if I use 32 million in a calculation, I would count the 3 and the 2 as significant figures, but I would ignore these other zeros. Again, because we're not totally sure about them. They're there to make sure we have the magnitude correct, that we're looking at the value 32 million as opposed to 32,000 or 3,200, but they don't actually tell us anything more precise. In fact, if we wanted it to be completely precise, what we would do is add a decimal point. For example, if I rewrote this as 32 million point zero, now each one of those zeros would be precise, and I would have a very precise number on my hands. Let's look at another example, a number like 5,000 liters. 
Not surprisingly, when you look at that number, right away it looks like a nice round number, and it probably is. So those zeros that are to the right of the non-zero digit, because there's no decimal point anywhere in this number, are not going to be counted as significant figures. The 5 is a significant figure, but these zeros are not. And again, if we wanted to communicate this digit, or rather this value as being more precise, we'd have to use a decimal point. Now, in our class and in a scientific setting, it's pretty much always okay to assume zeros on the right-hand side of a non-zero digit, as long as there's no decimal place or decimal point, never count. But in the real world, there are some examples where that zero may be significant and maybe not. Let's look at something like if you watch, uh, you know, something in another country that has you cooking, and you're cooking at a temperature of 70 degrees Celsius, which is a relatively warm temperature. 70 degrees Celsius, strictly speaking, has one significant figure and one insignificant figure, or one digit that won't count towards the precision of our number. However, in practical terms, we don't know if someone meant about 70 degrees Celsius or exactly 70 degrees Celsius. It's just not clear from this information. In order to make it clear, first of all, you can always assume that this is a rounded value and that there's one significant figure. But in practicality, if you're a scientist, this is not a really good number to write because it leaves a lot of ambiguity or uncertainty about what you were trying to communicate. So here's how scientists would fix this problem. They would rewrite this value in scientific notation. The number 70 can be rewritten in scientific notation as 7 times 10 to the 1. But depending on the precision of the value, meaning how sure we are, if we were exactly sure it was 70 degrees Celsius, we could write it as 70.0 times 10 to the 1. Notice that in the first example, I have one significant figure. In the second example, I have two. The difference between 70 and 7.0 times 10 to the 1 is this 0 is now behind a decimal point, and therefore it's significant. In fact, if I wanted to be even more precise, I could say 7.00 times 10 to the 1, or even more precise, 7.000 times 10 to the 1. And that's also true for all of the values that we work with that have a lot of zeros on the right-hand side. If my number 32 million actually had 4 degrees of precision, or four significant figures, I could write that in scientific notation as 3.200 times 10 to the seventh. Again, I'm taking as many zeros as I need to communicate the correct degree of precision. The number 5,000 liters, take a second and see if you can write that in scientific notation so that it has two decimal points. Go ahead, pause the video if you need to. To write the number 5,000 in scientific notation, and so it has two decimal points, again, I write the number 5. I would have to move my decimal point three places. And if I want two significant figures, I'd say 5.0 times 10 to the third. This gives me two significant figures, and times 10 to the third makes sure that this value is still equivalent to 5,000, just more precise. So there's basically three rules to remember when it comes to how to round your final multiplication, or rather, how to figure out how many digits you'll need in your rounding. For the most part, count all the digits you see, especially when they're non-zero digits. The only digits that may not count are zeros to the left of non-zero digits if there's a decimal point, and zeros to the right of non-zero digits if there's not a decimal point. These left-hand and right-hand zeros are still important to write down because they give us the magnitude of my value, but they don't communicate anything helpful about the precision of our measurement. I want you to have a lot of practice working with correct rounding. So I'm going to put a bunch of examples up on the page. Go ahead and pause the video and work on them. After you have a few of them done, you can go ahead and listen to the video to, in order to get the correct answers, or you can just work them all straight through. Okay, 
So in order to calculate the answers to these, I'm going to go one at a time. When I type 2.05 times 50 into my calculator, my calculator tells me the answer is 102.5. Now let's look at how I need to round this, if at all. This is a multiplication problem, and in multiplication, I always look at the number of digits as opposed to the number of decimal places. In the number 2.05, there's one, two, three significant figures. In the number 50, the five is definitely significant. What about this zero? Well, this zero is to the right, and there's no decimal place. So this may imply that this was actually the number 48, and it's been rounded. Anytime we have zeros to the right of a number where there's no decimal places, this is not going to count as a significant figure. So I have three significant figures times a value that has one. I need just one significant figure in my answer. I'm going to abbreviate that as one sig fig. So the number 102.5, I need to make this into a value that has just one significant figure. Well, to round 102.5 down to one sig fig, I'm basically going to need to round all these other values. When I do that, I get one significant figure, which is the number one. But keep in mind, I can't change the magnitude of this value. I'm just rounding it. So 102.5, when I round it, should give me just 100. That's correct because this one is significant. These zeros are not. Now let's look at 53 plus 0 0.026. When you plug this into your calculator, your calculator will give the answer as 53.026. You could even do that without your calculator, hopefully. To decide how to round this answer, because it's an addition problem, in addition and subtraction, we look at the number of decimal places. The number 53 has zero decimal places. I'm abbreviating. The number 0 0.026 has one, two, three decimal places. In other words, three digits after the decimal place. Because zero is smaller than three, I need to round my final answer so it has zero decimal places. That means I need to cut these off, and there's nothing to round up, so my final answer would be 53. When I take 620 times seven, ooh, when I take 620 times 7,040, I wasn't sure if I had the right number there, 620 times 7,040, I get the answer, and it's a long one, 4,3,6,4,8,0,0. In this case, let's look at how many decimals, or rather how many digits I need. This is a multiplication problem, so I'm looking at significant figures, not decimal places, which is good, because there are no decimal places. This first value, 620, has one, two decimal, or rather two significant figures. The zero doesn't count because it's to the right, and this is a number that has no decimal places and no decimal. The number 7,040 has the same issue. The seven counts, the zero counts, and the four count, but now I get to a zero that's to the right of the non-zero digits, and there's no decimal point, so it won't count. So I have two significant figures in this number. I have three significant figures in this number. I need to round my final answer to have two sig figs. There's really two ways to do this. One is to just cut off these other numbers until I get down to having two digits and replace them with zeros. Let's do that first. Notice that as I cut those values off, the last number I cut off was a six, which means I'm going to have to round up. So my final answer would be four, four, and then this would be zero, 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 zero. Zero, 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 zero. In other words, four million, four hundred thousand. Again, I need those zeros as placeholders, even though they don't give me any increased degree of precision. If that makes you uncomfortable, feel free to write this number in scientific notation. The first non-zero digit here is a four, so I would have 4.4, .4, and then I had to move the decimal place one, two, three, four, five, six, so 4.4 .4 times 10 to the six. Either one of these answers has four significant figures, or sorry, rather two significant figures. These zeros don't count, 
or by putting it into scientific notation, there's just two digits that are visible. In the question 0 0.03010 times 9.0, as I put that into my calculator, 0 0.03010 times 9, it gives me the answer 0 0.2709. Now I have to look, because it's a multiplication problem, at the number of significant figures. In 0 0.03010, I pur purposely picked this one, so you have to think about every type of zero possible. Right away, the 3 and the 1 are going to be significant, and the zero that's sandwiched in between will have to be significant. Now I have to decide whether the zeros on the left and the zero on the right counts. This number has a decimal point. The rule for decimal points is the zeros that are to the left of the non-zero digits don't count. Everything else will count. So that gives me a total of four significant figures. In the number 9.0, the 9 is significant, and this zero is to the right since there's a decimal point that doesn't matter, it will still count. So this has two sig figs. Now I need to round my final answer to have two sig figs. That means I'm going to cut these two values out. There's nothing to round up. And I get 0 0.27. For my final answer, or my final calculation, I have the number 3.040. So 3.040 times 125.0. Your calculator tells you the answer is 380. Now let's look at the number of significant figures and how to round it. I'm looking at significant figures because I'm multiplying as opposed to looking at decimal points if I add or subtract. The number 3.040, well the 3 counts, the 4 counts, and anything in between has to count. What about the 0 on the right? Well, this is a number with a decimal point, so value, the zeros on the left wouldn't count, but I don't see any. The zero on the right will count. And the number 125.0, for the same reason, has four sig figs. So this is four sig figs. This value has four sig figs. And if you look, the way the calculator gives it to you, my final answer has 380, which is just two sig figs, which is a problem because this zero is on the right and there's no decimal place. So how do I correctly write 380 so it has four significant figures? Well, I need to add a decimal place to show that I'm precise or I'm very sure about the value. To get to a total of four sig figs, I need just one decimal place zero because now I have one, two, three, four. Notice that by adding the decimal point, I made the zeros on the right count. If the decimal point isn't there, the zeros on the right don't count. So my final answer, I would report, is 380.0. I know this is a lot of different calculations, but the fact is that practicing these will help them make sense. And in that way, it's a lot like riding a bike. Once you get the hang of how to do correct rounding and when you need to add decimal places or remove them, once you know that, you'll always be able to do it and you'll never again wonder, how much am I allowed to round this number? On a really practical level, this is really important because even though we may not do anything that's really life-changing in an introductory chemistry class, when scientists are developing things like life-changing technologies, life-changing drugs and pharmaceuticals, or many other things that impact people in their everyday lives, it is important that we have the correct degree of precision with our number because if not, we might be telling somebody that we're more sure about something than we actually are. And that's a really big deal. For instance, if you're reporting something like the fatality rate for using a medication, it's really important to know how sure you are about that value, whether it's rounded, whether you round it up, and how precise it was. So keep in mind that even though sometimes it'll seem silly to remember so many rules just to know how to round numbers, eventually you'll reach a point where these values do become important, especially in the health sciences, and knowing exactly how sure we have to be is important. Important.